In the name of the true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The parable that we heard today is known as the parable of the wicked tenants. This moniker is helpful, I guess, but it doesn't really tell you what the parable is about. You may have noticed that Jesus has been telling parables aimed at the chief priests and the Pharisees that we've been reading in these past weeks. But it takes the chief priests and the Pharisees a while to realize that he is telling these parables against them. It takes them a while to see that they are the wicked tenants that Jesus is telling of in this parable. It takes us a while to realize that Jesus is talking to us in parables too. It's easy for us to think that we are better than the chief priests and the Pharisees, or at least that we are certainly not the chief priests and the Pharisees, and we probably feel pretty sure that we are not wicked. So what does any of this have to do with us? If you think that the crucial question in this parable for today is who are the wicked tenants today, then chances are good that you will dismiss the possibility that you are a wicked tenant, and this parable will have little or nothing to say to you, and you will start making your shopping lists in your head right about now. But it's possible that this parable can answer more than one question. If we are attentive enough to find a question that we think might have more to say to us, I think it's worth trying. There is much to distract us. We could get hung up on the issue of slavery and wonder if that's a question we should be asking about when we read the parable today. We could get hung up on the violence and the ruthlessness of the wicked tenants who beat one slave, killed another, and stoned another twice. We could get hung up on, the own, on ownership rights and the delusional notion of the wicked tenants that if they killed the landowner's son, they would somehow be rewarded with his inheritance. Getting hung up on any of these questions might actually lead us somewhere fruitful, but I am not hung up on any of them at the moment. Here is the question that I'm hung up on this morning. For whom, for whom did the landowner plant his vineyard? And why did he put a fence around it and dig a wine press in it and build a watchtower? Why, oh why, did the landowner immediately lease the vineyard to tenants and go away to another country? And why did he make the vineyard fruitful enough that the tenants would want to fight over the yield from its produce? Why did the landowner plant this vineyard? And who is this vineyard for? Let's cut to the chase and recognize that the landowner for who he is. The landowner is God. At the nine o'clock service with the kids, I get to be God. You, you can do with that what you will. Why did God plant a vineyard? And who is the vineyard for? Whom is the vineyard for? It seems clear that the vineyard was never meant for God's own purposes. The vineyard is not an investment property. What does God need a vineyard for? The only thing God needs a vineyard for is for the pleasure, the fruitfulness, and the occupancy of his beloved creatures who no longer, no longer are able to live in the gardens of paradise. But God still wants them to have someplace nice, someplace safe, someplace where it is possible to lead a happy and a fruitful life that has a significant measure of joy in it. Notice that it's a vineyard, not a potato field. Why did God plant a vineyard and build all its accoutrement? He built it for love. He planted it for love. The vineyard was always built for God's people and not for himself, which is to say that the vineyard was always built for us, for you and for me. If you close your eyes, you can imagine, if you will, that we are living in a vineyard of God's planting where God means for us to be safe and happy. 
Let's not fuss too much about where the vineyard is located. Let's say that the vineyard can be easily gerrymandered to include whomever needs or wants to be included. Let's say this is the best possible use for gerrymandering and that it is for a far preferable method when identifying the boundaries of the vineyard of the Lord than say firing rockets at one another. So if God planted us a vineyard and allows us to enjoy the pleasures and the safety of it as well as much of the fruit of its harvest, is it fair, is it right, is it reasonable for God to expect us to offer something back to him come harvest time? For the last three weeks in church, we have heard parables that include a vineyard. Last week, a father asked two sons to go work in the vineyard. The week before, we heard about laborers getting paid for their work in the vineyard. Next week, we will not hear about a vineyard, but we will hear about a banquet. And I assure you that the wine was or will, that was or will be served at that banquet is wine from one of these vineyards that we've been hearing about. I keep thinking about how reassuring it is in this world in which so much is uncertain. I keep thinking how reassuring it is to be told that there really is a vineyard. There really is a place that God intends for us to be well and happy and safe. And there really is a banquet at which we will all enjoy the fruits of the vineyard. I can hear you stop making your shopping list for long enough to think, what is he talking about? A parable is a story, not a map. There is no vineyard. It's a figure of speech, a fable at best. There's nothing real about any of this. We are so used to gerrymandering our own territory. We are so used to firing rockets that it's hard for us to discern that Jesus might be telling us something when he's telling us about a vineyard that we can't see from here, that he might be telling us something that's true. To say that there is a vineyard is to say that there is a kingdom of God. Or more precisely, that there will be a kingdom of God for us, since what already exists for God may not yet exist for us, even though everything is always happening everywhere. Somewhere in everything always everywhere, there really is a kingdom of God. There really is a vineyard. And the grapes that grow in that vineyard will produce whatever kind of wine you want or need, both kinds, red and white, or non-alcoholic wine, if that's what you need. There, re there really is a vineyard, and it belongs to God, but God has given it to us for all intents and purposes. And even though everything always happens everywhere, which means that God is never far away, it feels to us as though God has gone away to another country. Oh, it felt that way for such a long time. So many people feel as though God hasn't been seen in years. God's been gone so long that it seems to many people that they are not convinced that he ever was here in the first place. Or second of all, there is no point in pretending that we owe him anything. We can keep it all for ourselves. But to some of us, it feels as though we have one foot in a vineyard in this world and the other foot already in the vineyard of the kingdom of God. And we believe that God meant for it to feel this way. That's why we're here today, because we can't shake that feeling. And we sense that everything is always happening everywhere, which is another way of talking about eternity. And it feels like somehow we've always known why God planted the vineyard and who he made it for. We've always known that it was for love, that it was for anyone who wanted to claim God's love and call themselves a beloved child of God. And when we realize for sure that there is a vineyard, when, when we know it was planted for us, when we see that all of it the fence, the wine press, the watchtower, all of it that keeps us safe, 
all of us that lets us make wine, all of us that lets us prepare for the banquet, when we see that all of it was made for love, are we moved by love to return some measure of that love back to God? Or do we insist that possession is nine-tenths of the law after all and we never ever even dream of giving anything back to the one who gave us everything? God planted a vineyard. He put a fence around it and he dug a wine press in it and he built a watchtower. He planted and he built it for love of us, his people, and many, many, many others, some of them like us, and some of them not much like us at all. And because God knows that it's hard for us to perceive that everything is always happening everywhere, God also knew that it would feel to us as though he has gone away to another country and he has been there for a long, long time. This feeling, God knows, opened the door to all kinds of mischief and wickedness. And all of us were only always renters, after all. But God does not want us to fall prey to mischief and wickedness. God wants us to enjoy the blessings of the vineyard in the presence of his son. So God put a fence around the vineyard and dug a wine press and built a watchtower to try to account for our safety and our joy. God did it all for love. And the hope of God's heart is that we will return some measure of that love back. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.